before he was crucified. And, you know, when you start thinking about a lot of the things that Jesus did, uh, and it was driven home to me really good in the, in the episode of the, uh, the Chosen uh, two weeks ago, uh, when Jesus had gone to Nazareth and was reading from Luke and all the big confrontation he had there in the synagogue, that many of the things that Jesus said, um, even to his disciples, because they had been raised in the religious culture they had been raised in, they had been taught Torah, all of this, but many of the things that he said about himself and the things that he taught were blasphemous in their minds. Um, I mean, they were blasphemous. Uh, and because of that, um, you can imagine those guys had a lot to work through hearing him and listening to him and accepting the things that he was saying. I mean, there was a lot of religious baggage they were having to <coughs> discard to try to comprehend and understand, of course, the religious aspect of it. Um, the religious leaders, you know, they, they, or most of them didn't want to discard any baggage. They were ready to did have him murdered or killed. But that covenant meal, you got to remember, they're sitting at Passover and they're having Passover meal. And remember, Passover has been celebrated now for over a thousand years every year as Jews. And what this whole thing is all about it's remembering our deliverance from Egypt, God setting us free. And then on that night, Jesus turns it around and said, Now I'm telling you, this is all about me. I'm changing all this now. I'm changing it. And you, you know, you're sitting here thinking you know, how are, how are they perceiving that? Wait a minute, we've been doing this for over a thousand years and now you're telling us that you're changing it? You are changing it? We were given to this you know, we were given this command by Yahweh you're going to change this? And you know, that this is about me now. And this is about a new covenant and a new covenant that I'm going to you know, established with the shedding of my blood. And this bread now rep it represents my body. And this cup represents my blood. And as often as you do these things, whenever you celebrate Passover from now on, it's all about me. It's not about what happened then. It's about me. And so all of these, these things, you know, he's talking about this covenant relationship. There was a lot that they themselves had to, to, to work through and in the establishing of this new covenant. And one of those, again, had to do with the shedding of the blood of the Son of God, but the other one had to do with the oath. And, you know, God made an oath. And this is this is such a powerful thing because again, when you when you start understanding the importance of this oath aspect of a covenant, this is what gives us our security. In Christ, this is what when we talk about you know as, as as believers eternal security. We're not talking about you know something that's not important. We're talking about something that's absolutely absolutely essential to our peace, to our being able to live the Christian life, to know that we are eternally secure in Christ because of the oath that He has made. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here in Hebrews six. He said, for when, in verse 13, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. So the writer is going back into history. He's looking back at Abraham. He's looking back at the promise God made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and was reiterated in Genesis 15 and in Genesis 17. One of the times when God reiterated it, remember he put Abraham into a deep sleep. Abraham saw the vision of God coming between as and the smoking oven and then the light. You know, that God's walking between this. And, and Abraham is off to the side. But he's making a covenant with Abraham, but basically God's saying, this is all on me. You have nothing to do with this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to bless you as I am going to surely multiply you. And God was sealing that covenant with him 
with an oath. And, and, and in the covenant, in the new covenant that God makes with us, which he made with humanity, with me, with you, he is the guarantor in it on both sides. He's guaranteeing the divine side and he's guaranteeing the human side. None of it is on us. It is all on him. It has nothing to do with me and has nothing to do with you. And here's the thing. If the covenant had been made with me and you, we'd have been broken it within how many hours? <laughs> Pretty quick. Oh, uh, yeah. Think about it. Israel. I mean, God had just established his covenant with them there on Mount Sinai. And how many, you know, days after Moses gone down, they're already going back and they're going into idolatry. And they're worshiping an idol. I mean, they just they just could not keep it. And the thing is, the covenant that God makes with us, and this is the thing we have to understand: it is as sure and it is as unchangeable as God is Himself. As as sure and as unchangeable as God is Himself, it depended completely on God to make this covenant and to fulfill this covenant for us. If it had been up to mankind, we would have never sought salvation. I mean, when we talked about it a few weeks back, when Adam and Eve sinned, were they looking for any salvation when God came to them? They weren't looking for forgiveness. They weren't looking for help. What they were trying to figure out was how to cover it up on their own, how to fix it themselves. They didn't want God's help. They weren't looking for God. They were running from him and hiding from him. They were trying to figure out how they could do it with their own hands, and they did not want to seek it out. And if we had, if salvation had been left in the hands of humanity, the world would have perished because man does not. Because there's an interesting thing that Jesus said um, in John 3 and it's in verse 19, you know, after he's talked about um, the Father loving the world so much that he sent his Son in to the world to save it and give it eternal life. Um, in verse 17 in John 3, really, and this is going to, this will be the even as we point to Revelation. Um, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged, and he who does not believe has already been judged because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the judgment. And this is the thing, he says, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. There's the reason. Man would have never been saved or sought salvation. And the reason being is Jesus makes it clear. Here's the judgment, the declaration. The facts are men love darkness rather than the light. They will not come to the light. They will not come to the light in and of themselves. They will always cling to and remain in and stay in darkness because that's where men were comfortable unless someone has come, has come to do something about it. And that's exactly what happened. All the, all of the, you don't have to turn to these passages, but I want you to notice something in these passages that are even in Adam and Eve sin in the Garden of Eden. God makes the first covenant promise. And he says in verse 15 of Genesis 3, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Notice God says, I will do this. I am going to put enmity between Satan. There's going to be hatred. I'm going to bring this. I'm going to make this is going to happen. I'm going to do this between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. There's going to be this conflict between them. And when and when God spoke to Abraham, obviously, as we talked about in the past, all these covenant promises he made to Abraham, he, he said, I will, I will. Well, then he tells him the same thing in Genesis 22, verse 17. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, the sand which is on the seashore. Your seed shall possess the gate of the enemies. In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. I will do this. 
I will do this. And all, all the responsibility God's emphasizing, you know, is that he's taking all the responsibility off of man, and it's all on him. And those two passages that we've read a lot about in the last couple months, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, where God says, I will give you a new heart. I will forgive your sins. I will, you know, remove your sins. I will cleanse you. I will sprinkle clean water on you. He's talking about this new covenant in both those passages. So it's all on him. I'm going to do this. And he, this is a promise he's made. This is an oath. This is he's saying in this covenant relationship, this new covenant, I'm going to do this. And we read, <clears throat> we read this also as well uh, in one of the first messages. Not only did God say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the woman. I'm going to do all these things. He even determined the exact time that it would happen. In Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks have been declared for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for the iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So God didn't only just say, I'm going to put this enmity and I'm going to do all these things. I'm even going to set the exact time it's going to happen. It is all on me. And I'm promising you that this is exactly what I'm going to do. And if you go back to Hebrews 6, <clears throat> he also makes some statements following that. <clears throat> In verse 15, we're in 13 and 14. In verse 15, he says, And so having patiently waited, Abraham obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. So when they made the oaths, and they swore by, always swore by God, generally by the Lord, greater than themselves, that self, we got this covenant relationship. Well, it, it says in verse 17, in the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take Hope of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope that is both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus is entered as a forerunner for us having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he says that God swore. God interposed an oath so that we would be absolutely certain and secure that what he promised to do, he would do in his salvation of mankind, in our salvation, in our redemption, in our removing. He swore through those passages in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah to remove our guilt and our shame. If, if, if I'm sitting here tonight and I'm in Christ, my guilt and shame is gone. It's gone and it will never exist again. It has been destroyed. He swore he would free us from the authority of Satan. He would free us from the authority of sin. He would free us from the authority of death. He did just that. He swore that he would give us a new heart, a new spirit. And he swore that he would put us in a new covenant family, a new family. And he swore that he would also give us knowledge within us that he's there by his spirit to bear witness with our spirit that we belong to him and not depending on anything that we've done or not done. And he swore that he would bring us into union with himself. He swore all of that. And so he cannot lie, the writer says, when God cannot lie, it's impossible. It's not just that he won't lie, it's impossible for him to lie. It's impossible for him to lie. It's interesting, I watched a movie last night, 
daughter said, you know, see this movie, it's uh, one of those little um, spy, not spy, but the clue kind of a thing, who does. And one of the, the women in the movie, uh, she could not lie without throwing up. I mean, and, and when she was questioned by the police, if she got into a place where she started to tell a lie, she got sick. I mean, you know. So, you know, anytime so women, so they, they were like, well, she was one of the main witnesses. They were always wanting to talk to because they knew if she tried to lie, it would be exposed. And, you know, so it wasn't, you know, she, she, she could lie, but there was always possible. Well, the fact of God, though, it's impossible. It's not even possible for him to lie. It doesn't, no darkness exists within him. And he made a promise. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to do them for you. I'm going to keep my side of the agreement and I'm going to keep your side of the agreement for you so that you can experience all these things. I'm going to do it. And he did it. And he proved the validity of it by raising his son from the dead. It's done. It's all accepted. It's all absolutely complete. It truly is finished to do all of these things. You see, what God's promise did is God's promise revealed to us something essential about God, that God is faithful. His faithfulness to us. And all through the Old Testament, I mean, you read in the Psalms, we read about God's faithfulness, His faithfulness to Israel, His faithfulness to His part of the covenant, the promises He made. He is faithful, that He's reliable. I can count on Him. I can depend upon Him at all times. He is constant and He is absolutely unchangeable. I love how um, Paul in 2 Timothy in chapter 2, he's um, talking about why he endures all the things that he goes through for the sake of the church and all the fact that he was even in prison and he's going through it for the, you know, for the sake of God's people. And he says, listen, and in, in 2 Timothy 2.10, he says, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with the eternal glory. And he says, this is a trustworthy statement. It's a, it's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. I know there's been times in my life where I've been faithless how I am. I've not trusted. I've not done what I needed to do. But Paul says, look, we might become faithless, but guess what? He remains faithful for us. When, 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 when Paul talked about having crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not by faith in the Son of God. A lot of translations today translate it. The original language says by the faith of the Son of God. Or literally by the faithfulness of the Son of God. My life I live now is because of His faithfulness. And I rest in that. I'm secure in that. God cannot lie. He remains faithful. And He told the, the, the Jews in Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord. I change not. You can depend upon me. He says the same thing. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. There's no more variableness, as James says, or shadow of turning with him. He is absolutely dependable. And so the oath that he's made to us, all these things that he will do for us and has done for us is guaranteed. I mean, think about this. It is absolutely impossible for God to make a promise that he cannot perform. It's impossible for him to do that. He always keeps his promises. Always. And so, all we are required and asked of God to do to experience all the blessings of his covenant is what? Belief. It's belief. To believe the good things. Now, and we're going to talk about this <coughs> next week. But, a lot of people have a lot of <clears throat> misconceptions about faith. You know, some people think, uh, you know, when the New Testament talks about faith, the whole idea is that it's, it's, there's an allegiance to what you're believing in. 
there's a pledge of allegiance to that, a commitment to it. There's an entrusting of yourself to that. Um, it's not just you know acknowledging some facts up here uh, in your head. Faith. A lot of people perceive faith as a work or an energy of something that we do that we exercise. It's you know it has to come from us. And we've got to you know do this. We've got to believe it. You know. And again, if that's the case from a biblical standpoint to get us into a covenant relationship with God, how do we ever know if we believed enough? How do we ever know if we believed right? You know, did I have enough faith when I did that? When I, when I said those words, was it, you know? And again, the enemy likes for us to believe those things because that's how he can sow seeds of doubt inside of us. If we're thinking that in some sense this depends upon me, then the enemy has something with which to play with in my mind to deceive me. Some people think, you know, faith is the magical repetition of promises. Oh, if I just recite these promises enough over and over and over and over and over and over again, that will make it come to pass. It will make it happen. But the thing is that the scripture calls us to do is the scripture calls us to behold and to trust God's faithfulness to do what he has said, to simply rely upon it. The object of our faith is not ourselves. The object of our faith is Jesus. He's the word we're doing. He's the one we do. He's the one we look to. I mean, and again, again, the illustration was given in the Old Testament with uh, you know the children of Israel when they were getting attacked by all the serpents and all that, and Moses made the bronze serpent. And that serpent was placed, you know. Several million people there in the camp that served, you know, serpents up on a pole, and there was only one thing they were required to do in order to be healed, and that was what? Look. It didn't say you had to be able to see it. You're just looking in the direction. Look, and that look said, I believe what you said. I believe God said, if I look, I'll be healed. And they were. Same thing, that there's this whole idea that the object of our faith is Jesus. You know, the writer of Hebrews goes on to tell us in Hebrews chapter 12 that, you know, we look to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Our faith springs from him and he brings it to full completion. It's all in him. Paul said in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, by the word of God. We hear the word of the gospel. We hear this good news of what God has done for us in Christ in this covenant relationship. And it's good news. And we believe that, that, that there's, we trust that. We rely on that. And therefore we commit ourselves to the, to the person of Christ. We commit ourselves to following and we believe this good news. And it leads to what Paul said in Romans 1. Romans says that it produces the obedience of faith. Faith always produces an obedient life. Not a perfect life, but a life now that's leaning in the direction of following him, of obeying him, and of coming after him. So when we think about the Christian life, you know, it's not meaning we've written our teeth out gritting our teeth hard and trying to live it out. You know, the, the kind of people, and again, there's a lot of people in the church who say, oh God, I'm sorry, I messed up. Please, I promise you I'll do better. I promise you I'll try harder. I promise you I won't do this anymore. And we end up doing the same thing. We're right, oh God, I'm so, I promise I won't do it. it. That's not the Christian life. That's not what God, you'll find that in the New Testament, you'll find that in the covenant, you'll find that in the church. That's not that. It's not me and God. It's not like, okay, God's kind of got this part of it, but then all this part of it's all up to me. You know, I've got to do this part of it over here. It's not me kind of like the old saying, God is, you know, the sticker, God is my co-pilot. That's baloney. God is not my co-pilot. He's flying the plane. I'm just riding in it. Now I'm a passenger. He's the plane. He's the pilot. He's the engine. He's the fuel. I'm just sitting inside of it along for the ride. He's everything. You know, it's not me and God, because again, if, if any part of this covenant relationship is on me, I got a problem. And I'll never have any kind of security. You know, and then, then there's another side where, you know, we, the 
Christians a lot of times they, they, they mess up and all and they're just constantly, oh God, please, please, please forgive me. I beg you to forgive me. Oh please, you know, and all of this and then not understanding what did he say he has done for us in the covenant. He has forgiven us. He has taken away our sin. We don't have to beg him to do that because it was all done for us in Christ. And I love how, you know, there's this whole idea of us surrendering. It's us yielding. It's us resting. And it's us trusting in Jesus. He is the covenant. He not only is our representative, he is the covenant. It's all in him. And I love how Paul Paul takes this whole idea concerning the faithfulness of God and he describes the Christian life from beginning to the end. And we'll just run through these scriptures real quick and finish. Look at and we'll start out in first John, chapter one. Confess our sins. He is what? Faithful. faithful. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from how much of our sins. That's the covenant promise he made, wasn't it? I will cleanse you of all your sins. That's why this, this verse in 1 John, this is not given to believers here for us to just constantly confess our sins every day. This first chapter in 1 John is dealing with people who are not yet believers who are saying, we've never sinned at all. The Gnostics, we don't have any sin to deal with. And John said, that's not true, you're lying. But if you will confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. He doesn't deal with believers in sinning until chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This whole first chapter is about is, is really to an unbeliever. And so he says, this, look, if you confess your sins, which we did when we Believe on Jesus. God's, Paul says, look, God, John says, God was faithful and just. He was right to do it because he promised him to forgive you of all your sins and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. It's all gone. Because he's faithful to keep his promise. He did what he said he would do. And then he does the same thing in Philippians. Paul does in Philippians chapter 1. Paul talks about this very, the foundation of our lives on the faithfulness of God in our walk with him. And in Philippians 1, verse 6, for I am, what? Confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Notice what, who, where is the emphasis at on who's doing the completing of the work? It's all God. Why? Because God's faithful to do what he promised to do. He's going to keep his oath. He promised, I'm going to do this. It's all on me. It is all on me. And I will bring it to pass <clears throat> that I will finish the work that I started inside of you. And then <clears throat> he tells the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 1, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1, let's start verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. That's where the source of grace was that the new covenant was in Christ, that in everything, you were enriched in him, in all speech, and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to be to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, 
Jesus Christ. Why will you stand blameless? Why will you be brought to that place? Because God is faithful. You can trust that. That's why Paul could be confident. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10, 23. There's a lot of let us let us do these things. But and he goes up and let us draw near, you know, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, and then he gets to verse 23. He says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He's absolutely dependable. You can rely on him. You don't have to waver or worry. He made the covenant. He is all on him. You can rest and depend on him. And then 1 Thessalonians 5. This is a, when you start understanding covenant, you begin to read through all the New Testament. You start seeing these themes in all these letters of these guys because they understood the importance of the aspects of what made a covenant relationship. That's what the gospel is all about is this new covenant. And one of the aspects of that is the dependability and faithfulness of God. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who will also bring it to pass. <clears throat> You, what he says there, sanctify you entirely. Make you perfect in your spirit, soul, and body. Preserve you complete, perfect, brought to full maturity without any blame, no blemish, no spot. That's what he promised he would do. And God is faithful who will bring it to pass. First Corinthians 10, 13 uh, there's a progression. If you notice all of this, well, Paul and the unknown, these are stringing verses together, but there's a progression here. In 1 Corinthians 10 13, Paul gets into a practical aspect of God's faithfulness. He says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. He's faithful to protect you in temptation and make a way out of it for you. And then the last passage is the second Thessalonians 3. <clears throat> in Thessalonians, Thessalonians 3. He says, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So when you look at all these things, all these passages, the faithfulness of God is emphasized to us to say, look, you can depend upon him for the forgiveness and cleansing of all of your sin. You can depend upon him to finish what he started in you. You don't have to worry about that. You can depend upon him who will keep his promises. He will bring it to pass. He will not violate his word. He will keep you, preserve you, protect you from evil, from the evil one and all temptation. He'll make a way of escape as you're living your life. Everything is on him. Now believe that. Just believe that. And again, that belief is, is simply me resting and trusting in the reality. Does that belief produce actions in my heart? Yes. If, if he says, if I believe he's provided a way of escape from temptation, what am I supposed to be looking for when I'm in temptation? My way of escape. And then when it's provided for me, what do I do? I take it. I run. I go. I take it and get out. 
But that, but all of that though, it's it's still it, everything rests upon God. And when when we learn to to trust the faithfulness of God and the fact that we're in this covenant relationship with Him because of what He's done for us, it's all on Him. There, there is a rest and a peace that comes into our life that allows us to live a really full and abundant Christian life. We can really live a Christian life. Because most people's lives who are following Jesus tragically, especially here in the West, are spent trying to do something and keep something that's already been done. And then going to bed every night wondering, have I done enough? Or if they're facing death, did I pray right? Did I did I believe right? Did I get baptized right? Everything's on them. And living in fear, not in a settledness and confidence and peace. When you have confidence in the absolute dependability of God and his faithfulness, the one thing that's guaranteed is look at the history, look at the believers in the new covenant. Testament, we do not fear death. And I've said this so many times before, when you're not afraid to die, you're free to live. It's simple as that. When you're not afraid to die, you're free to live. And so, you know, that old thing with Stonewall Jackson when he went into battle and they always wondered how he could sit so tall in the saddle in the midst of bullets and flying by him and all in his faith it was my faith teaches me that because of God I'm as safe in battle as I am bed and I will not be gone until it's my time and I depend upon him and also he's, he's basing everything upon the promise of faithfulness of God any questions or comments or anything that's good news that's good news And if there's nothing else in the world, all you have to do is, it's like what Robert did a while ago, open up your Bible, pull out a map, and see that there is a modern nation called Israel that still existing. The reason why those Jewish people are still here, in spite of, in spite of everything, everything <laughs> is because God is faithful to keep his promise. He's returning to a land. And he's got more things in store for him in the future. We'll see in Revelation. He's not finished with it. That is one of the greatest testimonies of the truthfulness of God's faithfulness in all of history. It's the fact that there's still people. You don't, you don't, you don't see a whole lot of Babylonians running around anymore or Canaanites or anything like that. You still see the Jews. It's preserved and it's protected. And everything that he said that happened to us happened. When he said he would do four men bringing back to the land, he's done that. 